and welcome to the Bureau Asia podcast. I'm Matt Cowan, the Bureau Chief and your host. Thank you for listening in. Last episode, we trash talked with RMIT lecturer and researcher, Dr. Justin Pang, in an effort to get to the bottom of why littering is rampant in Vietnam and has become an accepted norm in a country rich in natural beauty. If you haven't already, give it a listen after this because Dr. Justin gives us a fascinating insight into the Vietnamese psyche and how it relates to littering behaviour. The interview drew some interesting responses in our Facebook group this week. Craig from Saigon said, They really should ramp up a promo to make the community take it seriously. I don't think they've really tried at all, which may answer where it sits as far as priorities go. Here it's a careless habit that seems embedded in the culture, maybe due to the troops of street cleaners that still do a great job providing an excuse to litter. Yes, Craig, the point you make does come up in the interview with Dr. Justin, to which he gives an interesting answer. For now, on the surface at least, it does seem embedded in some elements of society. Then Kyle, also from Saigon, said, Littering and many other things are simply bad behaviour. Very true, Kyle, but as research reveals on why humans litter, not just the Vietnamese, we behave according to cues in our environment. So if the norm appears to be that throwing litter by the roadside is the thing to do, then we'll instinctively do it. Vice versa, if a location is clean, we're less likely to litter. So what is good behaviour and what is bad behaviour comes down to what's accepted in a given society, it seems. As it relates to Vietnam, well, Dr. Justin certainly hasn't given up hope yet that the Vietnamese will change their ways. He's pinning his hopes on the young generations coming through who he says aren't as burdened as previous generations are or were and have more time, energy and desire to help clean up Vietnam. And finally, Nick in Bangkok said, Back in Australia in the 70s, they had the Keep Australia Beautiful campaign to stop people throwing tinnies. Macca's bags and Siggy butts out the car window. When that didn't work, they brought in $1,000 fines and the fun was over. Yep, I remember it well and I remember at school having to do yard duty and being responsible for your part of the school to be cleaned each day. And then there was the Tidy Towns initiative that encouraged the local community to take pride in how clean their town was and to demonstrate that littering wasn't tolerated there. Thank you all for your comments and if you'd like to comment or ask a question, there are a number of ways you can do it. If you're listening to this on Spotify, simply scroll down to the Q&A section below the episode notes. Or if you'd like to engage with our community, head to our group on Facebook. Just search the Bureau Asia group and you should be able to find it. And while I'm at it, please give our podcast a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It costs nothing but helps our content reach a wider audience. And please share it with friends and family, particularly those with an interest in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Okay, so on with this episode. In the first half of the episode, we catch up on what we've been doing this week, including what's been happening in the news. As usual, there have been some interesting stories pop up since our last episode, so I've cherry-picked a handful of them for you. And then we get Southeast Asian hospitality guru and good friend of the podcast, Chris Thompson, on the line from his home right here in Saigon. Chris is just back from the Asia's 50 Best Restaurants Awards Night in Singapore, where the region's best restaurants were recognised, so we ask him about that including what's going down in Vietnam's hospitality scene. So be sure to stick around for that. And sticking by me again this episode is the Bureau Asia's content manager, Melanie Kasul. How are you, Mel? Hey, I'm good. I'm just... (laughs) Having a hard time staying hydrated and cool in this heat. Really. Hey, um, speaking mm-hmm. of sticky, Ooh. summer has truly arrived in Saigon. 37 degrees Celsius yesterday Ooh. and probably the same today. 
But apart from being blistering hot out there on the roads, do you know how else I know it must be summer? Uh, I don't know. Hard to tell for me. You know, it feels like summer all year long lately. Oh, <laughs> wait. Maybe that's just my menopause. <laughs> I'm not going there. No. Your answer, the answer is no anyway. <laughs> yeah. The proliferation of ninja leads. They're out in force, Mel. <laughs> there are legions of them. And I've seen the most ridiculous get-ups this week from puffer jackets and knitted gloves <laughs> to full one-piece numbers that cover them literally from head to toe. Wow. To even, get this, uh. a brown fluffy hooded jacket that from behind made the driver look like a human-sized teddy bear that had escaped (laughs) from someone's bedroom. (laughs) Oh, don't forget, those face nets babies have on. It reminds me of the late Michael Jackson's kids when they were kids, you know? Yeah, those nets. Now, you know, for all the advancements this country has undergone in our time, Mm -hmm. I'm amazed there isn't still this really suitable riding attire that looks good, breathes and has UV protection that hasn't taken off yet. It's got to be hot under there. <laughs> Look, at the Japanese brand Uniqlo has them, I think. Um, oh, right. But, okay. but more like, you know, these light um, jackets, you okay. know, with like the... Are they those full length? N- no, 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 yeah. no, no. But I bet if designer labels invest in those kinds of full length costumes with, you know, the Louis Vuitton and the Gucci brands... Man, they're going to make lots of money here. So what are we doing? Let's do it. We can even make the fake ones. We could make some fake ones, hey? That'd be pretty cool. Cool. But as we know, vanity drives decision-making a lot, especially in Vietnam where women go to extremes to not get tanned. Now, apart from the premature ageing it causes and the risk of skin cancer, which is a valid concern. Yeah, of course. Women here cover up mostly for aesthetic reasons. White is still the colour of choice, Mel. (laughs) And I've also been told that it's preferable Mm -hmm. to look fair in order to attract the opposite sex. Uh -uh. I beg to disagree. (laughs) I mean, you married me because of my (laughs) exotic skin, right? Among Uh, other attributes. Just just to let you know, Mel, I'm (laughs) actually white. So (laughs) as I said, white is the colour of choice around here. Uh, Can can I say that? Uh, So my choice. Yeah. Uh, In any case, I am keen to do a beauty episode one day. Mm, What do you think? Yeah. We can get hold of a plastic surgeon or someone like that to interview. Uh I actually met one young lady at the airport last year who was training to be a plastic surgeon, (gasps) but I can't remember her name. Wait, I know a beauty pageant coach that has his teeth whitened (laughs) regularly. It like glows in the dark. There'd be more than one. Well, in that case, we'll get him in if we forget to pay the power bill. (laughs) So anyway... How was your week? Oh, I was so pumped up for Easter hot cross buns the whole week. Because, you know, being Christian, um, celebrating uh, Holy Week, well, not celebrating the first part anyway. But yeah, celebrating Easter. But unfortunately, I got disappointed with the brand we bought yesterday. Yeah. So that shall remain nameless. Yeah, yeah. For now. But apparently there's like three different... Uh, places that were making hot cross buns. Okay. But unfortunately, two of them are in District 2. And then the ones that we, we had in District 7, yeah, that kind was the only one that, I, that we can get here. And yeah. So it was big, too dry. Big cross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cross that off the list next year. <laughs> yeah, so I wish we were living in the D2 bubble. Oh, no. Am I allowed to say that out loud? <laughs> Don't worry. No one listens to this, so I think in you're in the clear. District 2. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere. Now, uh, this week I checked out some coffee shops, mm-hmm. uh, whatever day it was. I had a latte at three different cafes here in Saigon, and they all came in at different prices and vastly different qualities. The prices Mm. ranged from 60,000 dong up to a whopping 100K. Oh, wow. Per glass? Which is about $4.50. For a mug? For a latte. Yeah, yeah. I am the mug, (laughs) but they're paying (laughs) $100,000. Double shot, single shot. (laughs) Single shot. Oh, wow. Hey, any salted coffee? A few friends of mine on social media have been posting about that. I didn't have any. Maybe, maybe there was Mm -hmm. on the menu. I didn't check. Uh, I was. Recovering from the heart palpitations when I saw the, the, the price. prices. <laughs> uh, but anyway, salted coffee, we'll come back to that in okay. a bit. 
Now, I posted one of the places in our Facebook group, a new okay. one called Arabica. Mm. You know, the one with the percentage yeah. uh, logo. Okay. Um, and it's located in the apartment block at 42 Winhui Street in ah, District 1. the old building. Yeah. Okay, the Instagrammable there's building. There's a whole bunch yeah. of cafes and stuff there. And it sparked some debate about what makes a good coffee and what's a decent price to pay for one these days. Look. Coffee should really be classified with, you know, <laughs> under under something with a vice tax these days, like soda, alcohol, and tobacco in the Middle East. All right. Okay. All right. I'm not too sure what you mean by that, but coffee became a bit of a theme for me this week. I came across a couple of interesting stories about coffee in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. One, somewhat surprising about the increasing number of Vietnamese coffee farmers in the Central Highlands province of Ya Lai or if you're up in the north, Zalai, mm -hmm. bulldozing their coffee plantations oh. and turning them into passion fruit farms. Oh. Yeah, it shocked me a little bit. They say the amount of work required to maintain the farms isn't worth it. Okay. So they're replacing them with passion fruit vines as oh. exports to China open up, leading to, get this, the doubling in price per kilo for the fruit. Oh, or durian. Remember our friend Jade, yeah, uh, yeah. Stevo's uh, missus, yeah. mentioning that, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Durian, yeah. Uh, that market's opened up in China as well, so that might be pushing it. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, the Vietnamese are very quick to jump on trends around here. Okay. And as you mentioned earlier, Mel, you beat me to it. <laughs> Salt coffee Ooh. is apparently a thing. Okay. I see a cafe in Hanoi has taken salt coffee, which is apparently popular in Hue in mm -hmm. central Vietnam to the capital city. When we were driving around last night around District 7, we saw a uh, salt yeah. co coffee shop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. I, but in District 7, yeah, yeah, it must be a bit of a thing down here as well. So the cafe up there in Hanoi is called Salt Mate and appears to be an example of perhaps the trend of young Vietnamese who've had the opportunity to study overseas and are bringing back their entrepreneurial spirit and things they've learned abroad. I don't know if that's true. I'm just making it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely has the hallmarks of that, which is exciting to see. Ooh, Salt Bay Coffee Chain. That is a yeah. nice ring to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Yeah. I guess uh, she couldn't stake a claim to that for copyright reasons. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Anyway, drinkers report it being creamy, richer and more fragrant okay. and also easier to drink, apparently, and mm -hmm. not too bitter, which is achieved by adding whipped salt cream. Mm. So it actually looks quite similar to egg coffee and apparently it follows the trend of heavy cream coffee up in Hanoi. Ooh. Yeah, they're an odd bunch up there. What about salted egg coffee? You know, it's kind of like that Singaporean dish, you know, salted, salted egg shrimp, yeah. steer fry, or those salted egg chips. Yeah, yeah, you know? that could work. Yeah. Or uh, what about salted caramel coffee? That'd work if it hasn't been done already. Yeah, I don't know. just maybe add Starbucks a, does it? Maybe just add salted caramel yep. ice cream on yep. top. Oh, yeah, it sounds pretty good. Yep. And the other interesting one was a coffee shop that has a pay as you feel policy, uh -huh. whereby you pay what you think the coffee you had was worth. Kind of like those karaoke joints too. Pay as you feel. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if that was the case, I'd be drinking free coffee all week long. I'd imagine the cafe wouldn't stay open too long then. No. But hey, um, I'm glad you didn't hit me with that joke. So the cafe, again in mm -hmm. Hanoi, is called Fin Bar. That's P-H-I-N. Okay. Named after um, the style of coffee with the small filter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are no fixed prices and the owner says the concept came about by chance because his cafe was for friends to come over and enjoy his coffee okay. and then over time customers wanted to pay for his brews and so he encouraged them to leave a donation and a large coffee filter on the way out. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Is, is this the business plan, you know, inspired by those cocktail bars that opened a GoFundMe page Ooh. during the pandemic and then turned out the owners went back to the USA with their newborn baby and then opened a new bar? Okay, cue. Ooh, Trigger Sarah. warning. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so, Mel. I think this one is different, whereby the owner is actually saying only give me money if you really want to, whereas the other one was just begging for it. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> anyway, the most this young chap in Hanoi has received from a customer is 100 US dollars wow. by a customer from Hong Kong. Um, I wonder what was in that cup. Wow, okay. So the lowest that he's received is change like 200 and 500 dong. Not 1,000. Okay. 200 dong, <laughs> which I didn't know we still had. I don't think it's in circulation anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I think we've got one on the fridge over there, haven't we? Yeah, oh, we no, did that's have a, some. Yeah, no, that's an old 5,000. Oh, right. Yeah, paper okay. 5,000, red color. Wow, I guess he can open a buy me a coffee creator <laughs> account. You know, similar like to those Patreon accounts, yeah. you know, or something like that. Yeah. I mean, buy me a coffee. The platform is really great. It, it accepts credit cards, PayPal, Apple yep. Pay, Google Pay. Yep. I wonder if local apps like Momo or Zalo Pay have similar tools like well, that. Well, let's look into it because I'm wondering how we'd go if mm-hmm. we followed this model <laughs> for our podcast. <gasps> how much do you think we'd rake in each episode? I have no idea, but I. I'd be happy with like a million a oh. month, to be honest, oh, right you know, okay. a month, like not, not like a one-off tip, you know, it could help pay for the monthly electric and internet bill yep. at the very least. Yep. And we're not begging. Look, to be honest, I'd just be happy if our friends and followers actually shared this, <laughs> this podcast for <laughs> once with a few nice comments, of course. And um, just before we wrap up, mm-hmm. uh, one last thing on coffee. This Thursday, April 13, is the first day of the International Cafe Show here at the Exhibition Centre in District 7. I'm going to go along to that. There'll be 200 plus brands from 10 countries and an expected 30,000 plus attendees from over 30 countries. So it'll be a big one and it's on till Saturday the 15th. Hey Mel, as usual, there isn't any shortage of interesting stories coming out of Vietnam and the region. Oh, let me guess. Another Bali, it's so white fiasco. (laughs) Hey, you're good at that. But uh, we're not leading with that this week. The one we're leading with has received a lot of attention as Hoi An authorities Mm. have announced that they will begin collecting (gasps) entry fees from visitors to the old town from mid-May. Overrated. <laughs> oh, get out. Mal, keep your opinions to yourself for a moment. Okay. okay. Uh, as you can imagine, travellers far and wide vehemently voice their opinions as entrance fees for foreigners will be five US dollars. Oh, you can buy a coffee with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Vietnamese will have to pay approximately $3.50. Look, I don't know why people are whining. Fees help pay for utilities like cleaners and gardeners, for example that help make the tourist location clean and green. Yep. As you say, the money is earmarked for use to, I quote, improve infrastructure, restore downgraded relics and organise tourism events. And Uh although I can't confirm this, (gasps) the removal of Karens. Oh, exactly. (laughs) An entrance fee to the area isn't anything new though. Currently, if you wish to visit a selection of sites within the old town, you're required to pay for tickets, mm-hmm. but this new decree means that tourists will have to pay regardless of whether they visit these places or not. Also, it's like an environmental fee, you yeah, know, like so. they're yep. in Boracay, for example, in the Philippines, part of your um, boat ride to the island is like part of the environmental yeah. fee. Yeah. Yeah. So look, on the flip side, maybe this will deter influencers and YouTubers because they don't want to pay for stuff, right? We can only hope. <laughs> Perhaps the authorities should think about other tiered options for ticket prices, like pay $6.50 and get to push one influencer <laughs> into the river with impunity. From the Japanese bridge? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a photo. Okay. Uh, or pay $10 and push in three. Oh, okay. Anyway, before we get excited by those prospects, going by a news story this week, mm-hmm. there's still a chance this won't be implemented as it quotes the director of the town's Centre for Culture, Sports, Broadcasting <gasps> and Television as saying local authorities are still gathering opinions from locals and visitors. Ah, I vote yes. Pay the ticket. I'm hopeful it will help Hoi An's UNESCO status in the long run. Well, I think you're only saying that because there's little chance you're ever going back to Hoi An anyway. True. You're not a huge fan. No. But speaking of opinions, comments beneath the article were mostly critical of the decision, saying it's a silly money grab. 
that it's absurd and that people would rather go elsewhere than pay the US $5. Well, those might be the kind of tourists we don't want to have in Vietnam, so let them go elsewhere <laughs> yeah, then. Yeah, send them to Tao Dien. <laughs> Still, others support it and say the sum of $5 is a paltry sum, mm. not that kind of paltry, Mel. Okay. And that if people have an issue with it, just stay home. What do you think, Mel? Will this sway you either way? Look, like I said, pay up. Spoken like a true Filipina. Now, barley is the gift that keeps on giving. Oh. And an article this week in the Australian Financial Review nailed it with a hilarious editorial last Thursday with the heading, Bali is overrun by influencers. Locals are fighting back. Yeah, I loved reading that article. It was written by an Aussie lady, right? Well, judging by a boyfriend's name, Frank, okay. it's a good chance. <laughs> okay. Could have been Bruce. That would have been clearer, probably. Sure. But or the, Matt. Yeah, uh, yeah. The author of the piece had been in Bali on holiday with her boyfriend, said Frank, and had been given a tour of what she called the more arcane offerings in Ubud. Mm -hmm. What she discovered was that Ubud, and indeed much of Bali it seems, has become a place where spirituality merges with crypto capitalism in a montage of flapping linen. <sighs> and that the island has become a magnet for 20-something digital nomads, life coaches, and wellnesspreneurs attracted okay. by what seems from afar the low cost of living which allows them to convince prospective clients they're living a six-figure lifestyle. Ah. But as the author says, even in famously tolerant Bali, the welcome has worn thin. Uh, those backpackers wearing elephant pants, wellness guru, linen caftans. What's a caftan? Oh, it's like this, um, you know, a caftan. So it's like, a, how, do you, how do you describe it? It's a full-length um, flowy yeah. garment. Right. And then the yoga type activewear that show camel toes <laughs> have definitely yeah. worn out <laughs> their welcome. Yeah, camel toes are definitely a thing, it seems. Yeah. Anyway, the author and her boyfriend wind up being taken to a retail and restaurant precinct with mm. a co-working space that hosts workshops that include neuroscience of partying, warrior oh. mode putting healthy masculinity into practice through fighting, <laughs> Primal okay. rewilding. What? Death and rebirth ceremony. Okay. Superhero level health. Fungal wizardry. Full body gasm 101. <gasps> no, I'm not making this shit up. What? Well. Rope love and sacred dirty talk. Ooh. Really? <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> look, I'm not surprised. I mean, even here in Vietnam, I heard there's like an upcoming... 420 oh, festival. Nice. Oh, yeah, I mean, cool. how in the who did that get approved? <laughs> um, well, that'd be something I'd sign up for. Now, which one of the above, Mel, are you signing up for? Was there a Tantra meditation workshop? <laughs> and you're complaining yeah. it's sticky here. Yeah, that that sounds Tantra interesting. thingy would be off the sticky charts. Oh. Anyway, the list of absurdities goes on, which I don't know how to report, actually, without getting our listeners turned off. Look, it sounds interesting, but I'm not paying someone to tell me to talk dirty <laughs> amidst the backdrop of the sake of sacred Mount not Agong. These, not these days, no. at least. Anyway. I mean, it feels a bit weird and disrespectful. Maybe they should move the event to Pattaya okay, or something. Okay, now you're talking, Mel. Yeah. Perhaps I could claim some some of those on tax. <laughs> anyway, business trip. Yeah, what I can report though is that less than two weeks ago, mm -hmm. Indonesia and Russia inked a new extradition agreement. This comes after a group of 17, mostly Russian tourists in Jimbaran, filed a noise complaint about local roosters, <laughs> to which the governor is allegedly said to his constituents, keep as many chickens as you can. <laughs> oh, wait till they complain about the monkeys. I bet those macaques will fight back and open their own YouTube channel. Hey, you've just stumbled across my new channel idea. Yeah. No doubt there's a niche for monkey lovers. Yeah, but, yeah. we can put a hidden camera and just watch Watch them groom. We've just got to get some monkeys. Get our hands on some monkeys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we've got peanuts. So yeah. boom, boom. Um, but anyway, there's a silver lining, lining to all this, Mel. The shirtless American empowerment coach we featured ah. in one of our recent episodes who goes by the name Lion Galban. Okay. And who was filmed shouting at the police. Who the one with dreadlocks. Stopped him, yeah. 
for not wearing a helmet and who was accusing them of wanting to steal his money ah. has apparently left <gasps> Bali oh, and wow. set his Insta account to private since the video went viral. Karma. Oh, great. Bali is now less white. <laughs> Now, moving closer to home for you with this story, Mel. Yeah? 106-year-old Philippine tattoo artist oh, yeah. Apple Wang Odd became the oldest ever cover model when she appeared on the front page of Vogue this month. Mm. Wang Odd has lived all her life in the tiny remote village of Buscalam. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. In Kalinga province in the far north of the Philippines. Yep. She's the last of what they call Mamba Batok. Mamba Batok. Okay. Yeah. Batok yeah. is mm. actually like, you know, when you're like hitting hitting oh, somebody behind okay, your so neck. Okay, so the tattoo technique No, but is... actually Batok is like hitting somebody oh, behind your neck. So okay. Mamba Batok. Right. Yeah, but it's also hitting. Yeah. And it's also the kind gesture of, the of hitting, pounding. Onomatopoeia. Is that the word? Onomatopoeia, yeah, Yeah, that's right. Tok, 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 tok. The word made from the sound. Oh, nice. Yeah, Yeah, so it describes the thousand-year-old tattooing technique of Mm. tapping the skin with a thorn attached (gasps) to a bamboo stick and using soot from charcoal. I have tattoos, but (laughs) I don't think I'm brave enough to get an old-style tattoo done, even from her or, you know, anyone else. It's a commitment for sure, but props to those that did and want to. Better catch her before yeah. knock on wood. Yeah. Hey, did you know that Nas Daily got embroiled? I knew you were going to bring him up. <laughs> so, yeah, before Nas Daily, you know. Yeah, um, we mentioned him in a podcast mm-hmm. last year, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, and it was about um, appropriating Apple Wang Odd's uh, art yeah. and uh, the, the traditions of her people. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, tattoo aside, the pain mm-hmm. from that, I don't think I'd make the trek <laughs> to the village <laughs> to the where village, she is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, for a long time she went unnoticed by the outside world until the Discovery Channel series Tattoo Hunter came across her in 2007. Since then it's became a kind of pilgrimage for tattoo enthusiasts to make the 12-hour or so trip from Manila to her village. Yeah, it's definitely taken a long while, you know, for the definition of beauty to diversify. So I'm really glad it's getting a facelift, (laughs) pun intended. (laughs) I welcome all the positive vibes around the story. Yeah, it's a good one. And let's not forget, yeah, she's 106 years old and looks stunning. It's a great shot. And we're continuing with the feel-good stories, Mel. This time we cross over to the land of the rising sun, Japan, where the country's first ever Vietnamese rock band are getting noticed. Hey, come (laughs) by! It's an unusual phenomenon, isn't it? Because we're used to culture coming from places like Japan to Mm -hmm. influence Vietnamese culture, not the other way around. Well, Japan probably welcomes the younger generation of Vietnamese coming to their shores. and. Offering up new and exciting things because Japan is an aging country. Yep, yep. Yeah. So the band called Kurok consists of five Vietnamese members and one Japanese member, and they sing in both Vietnamese and Japanese. You know, in the 80s and 90s in the Philippines, obviously known for our musicality, um, (laughs) there's a lot of cover (laughs) bands. Not me. (laughs) Yeah, there were a lot of bands that went to Japan, um, but they did a lot of cover songs, not really original songs, which I assume Cool Rock is doing. So, yeah, um, none of those bands reached this kind of hype. Right. Yeah, so following the success of their first music video, the band has released three subsequent singles, and it seems they're on their way to being big in Japan. Oh, watch out, David Hasselhoff. Wasn't he big in Germany? Oh, Wasn't yeah, that? that's true. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. watch out, Tom Cruise. Oh, he's big in Japan, is he? All the... <laughs> well, he's pretty small, so... <laughs> yeah, anyway. I guess the question is anyway, Mel. Yeah? How does a Vietnamese band start up in Japan? Well... Beto Namujin. Okay. Do you know what a Beto Namujin is? No, bento, like a bento <laughs> lunchbox? <laughs> uh, beto Nam. Beto Nam. Beto Nam. What does it sound like? Beto Nam. Beto Nam. Vietnam. And oh. Jin, is, Jin is person. Oh. So in, in Japanese, okay. a Vietnamese person is a Beto Namujin. Oh. Anyway, I discovered uh, Beto Namujin 
represent the second largest community of foreign residents in Japan behind the Chinese. Oh, wow. There are said to be close to 500,000 working, studying and living in Japan. And just a few days ago, as it happens, Mm -hmm. a union of Vietnamese associations in Japan was established to strengthen connectivity and to support a growing Vietnamese community there. And just yesterday, there was a Vietnam festival in Tokyo to celebrate 50 years of diplomatic ties between the two countries. Wow. Cosplay is pretty big here too, you know. There's a lot of dressing up events in the city. Big attraction, again, for the young people. Yeah, we came across one a couple of years ago in District 5, didn't we? we Which was odd. It was just an odd thing to see, wasn't it? (laughs) No, but it was a youth centre. Yeah. So a oh, lot of true. these events happen yeah. in, you know, the yeah. youth centers per district. That's when we were at the Koi Cafe. Oh, yeah, the one with the fish. Yeah, That's right. where you sit, you sit and have a coffee and you're surrounded by a big goldfish. Yeah. And just before we move on, it's not actually a new thing for Vietnamese to go to Japan as it happens. There was this thing called the Dom Yu movement, as in Dom Yu Street. Oh, in, in District, District 1. 1. Okay. Yep. From 1905 to 1908, led by fanboy Zhou who has a street named after him near Bentan Market. You may have noticed that. Yep. Uh, Back then it was political and for revolutionary purposes, quite different from why young Vietnamese are going to Japan today. But there you go, quite interesting, hey? Mm. So, yeah, Vietnam and Japan have a long history of relations. And finally, Mel, this one makes me ache just thinking about it. Oh, is it coffee prices again? (laughs) Yeah. A story in the Vietnam News this week featured a South Korean man who in just 70 days Mm -hmm. has run the length of Vietnam from Kamau in the south to Hanoi. Wow. I wonder what kind of tourist visa he has. (laughs) Yeah, good point. Seven days? 70 days? Perhaps he just does a border run every so often. (laughs) But get this, he's turned around and doing Mm -hmm. it all again from Hanoi back down to Kamau. Wow, that's commitment. Yep. So the run is 2,358 kilometres, mm-hmm. which means by the time he's done, apart from being knackered, <laughs> he'll have run almost 5,000 kilometres in four to five months, <gasps> I guess. He's 55 years old, runs 30 kilometres a day and carries a 10 kilogram backpack and has lost 19... Sorry, I'm thinking of a joke as I say <laughs> this. I'm not going to say it. I'm okay. doing everything I can to not say this joke. Okay. And he's lost 19 kilograms since he started. Wow, that's that's pretty <laughs> cool. I mean, that's one way of dealing with a midlife yeah, crisis. But I guess we're all running away from something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, after just five days rest, he started his return journey on March 16. Okay. So I'm wondering where he is now. I think our South Korean listeners, okay. we do have them. Yeah, we, we do. We rank in the South Korean charts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd be interested in hearing from him. Wow. If anyone listening knows how to get in touch with him, let us know. He'll probably end up at FV Hospital. (laughs) (laughs) Which would be convenient for us because it's just up the road, isn't it? Yeah, so that's being a bit selfish. No, but but um, joking aside, I hope he's well. Either that or a massage place. (laughs) Foot massage, yeah, Uh, yeah, true. No, but, um, you know, wish him well and hopefully safe return to, he's from Ho Chi Minh City? No, he's from Korea. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, he lives in Ho Chi Minh City. No, no, he doesn't. Oh. Uh, he came over here, I think, on a holiday. Okay. And um, liked it. And wow. then, as you do, he kind of thought, I'll run from bottom <laughs> to top and then back again. Okay. Uh, but he said in the article that he is thinking about um, moving to here. Vietnam. So let's see how he pulls up after that. But seems as though not a ciggy or a bottle <laughs> of soju in sight for wow. that young man. Uh, but definitely will be keen for a good old massage, <laughs> won't he? Anyway, I'll do my best to track him down and see if we can get him on as a guest for our upcoming South Korea episode. Oh, maybe we can record it while you and him are on massage chairs (laughs) and getting a foot rub. (laughs) There's going to have to be a lot of editing if that, and there'll be a lot of heavy breathing down the mics, no no doubt. Well, 
Recently, the Asia's 50 Best Restaurants Awards Night was held with a lavish ceremony and networking event in Singapore. And the hospitality community here in Vietnam had been eagerly awaiting to see if any local restaurants were going to make it into the coveted top 50. A week or so earlier, spirits had been dampened somewhat as not one Vietnam restaurant managed to make it into the top 100 to 51 list. This followed a similar result last year when, again, no entrance from Vietnam made it into the top 50. After the excitement of 2021 when Peter Gung Franklin's Anang Saigon broke a decade-long drought by coming in at number 39. So how did it all go? To fill us in on that and what's going down in Vietnam with hospitality news, we chat to Saigon-based hospitality guru and communications consultant, Chris Thompson, who made the arduous two-hour flight over to Singapore just for the event. Hi, Chris. Are you there? Good morning. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you? Hey, I I stayed in last night knowing (laughs) that I had a a very important... uh, media engagement this morning so I'm as fresh as anything actually oh wow thanks for and, that and excited <laughs> cool well yeah. thanks for taking the time to do it pleasure okay let's get straight into it were you surprised that just one Vietnam restaurant made it into the top 50 make that the top 100 this year I think the answer to that question is almost yes and no mm. and I was thinking about this I was thinking about it this morning and Firstly, I've got to say, you know, it, for ourselves, we are right in the middle of everything that's going on in the in the dining environment here mm. in Vietnam. And I really feel that the rate of growth, the rate of improvement in the fine dining industry here in Vietnam since around 2016, when the likes of all of these independent restaurants opened, like your, you know, your Anans and Quinces and before that, the Tomatitos and, and then up into, into Hanoi with Tung, etc. Mm. The rate of growth in Vietnam, it's very, very significant. The actual rate of that might be the most developed in the whole region of Asia or even Southeast Asia. But sometimes, you know, the benefit of being able to travel allows us to put some of these things into a bit more of a wider context. I've been fortunate enough to travel a lot to Hong Kong and Bangkok and Singapore recently. And we do need to appreciate and realize the quality of these uh, restaurants in these mega cities. And I was just trying to do a little bit of research and I still I don't have the exact numbers to hand, guys. But if you look at the amount of Michelin starred restaurants That's right. in mainland China, Singapore and Bangkok, there's about 200. What? Wow. Okay. You know, and then if you go and add uh, Japan and, and Korea onto that, you, Taiwan, you're going to pretty much double that. So you're in a region whereby you're looking at a top 50 or a top 100. Mm. And there's already, you're already, if you like, you wanted to use the word competing against 400 very well established Michelin star restaurants to get into that 100. So mm. I guess as a starter for 10, it's always going to be a, a tough ask, isn't it, yeah. to, to go and do that? And it's not, um, sorry, it's not just the country, Chris, right? It's a, it's the cities. So there could yeah, be multiple sure. mega cities inside that country that will vie for yeah. the, the list. Hmm. So I guess it's always going to be, it's going to be a relatively high bar to get over to begin with. But there's other factors that I know that, I know that the Bureau are well, aware of and and cover this very well but it's ultimately about getting people into vietnam isn't it it's about increasing the flow Mm. of general tourists and general visitors into vietnam um as an example if we talk about asia 50 best voting population yeah i think there's around it, it says on the website but there's about 308 voters within that population so in order for vietnam to to be recognized, a, a good proportion of those voters are going to need to flow through Vietnam at some point. Right. And, point. you know, there's been some great articles on, on your platform about what's going on with the visas, what's happening with the tourist numbers and so on. And so I guess until Vietnam is able to play a larger role at a more macro tourist level, it's going to be a challenge. And I guess the likes of Singapore and Bangkok, you know, mm, they're very, Tokyo. very welcoming and very, 
Exactly. So there's some of these other other factors which hopefully will be resolved in the shorter to medium term, which will also help, you know, to drive that. Well, we can always um, hope for next year, maybe a better better representation next year. There's a couple of other bits as well. You know, one of the things I, I really noticed when I was at the awards last week is how connected all of these restaurants and chefs are, particularly around Instagram. Mm. And so I'd love to see a lot of our young and dynamic chefs coming through, posting more, sharing more on, on Instagram and following more of these chefs. And I, I think as a result of that, that will drive connectivity a little bit more as well. Mm. That's definitely that- a trait that I see. I thought their Instagram yeah. game would have been up to scratch, being young young Vietnamese who are on Instagram constantly. But maybe they're using the Vietnamese language to do hashtags oh, okay. and their copy. Do you think that might be, you know? But when I look at it, I, I see Thierry from La Villa. He's 10,000 plus followers. Of course, our mate Peter Kung Franklin, um, very active on uh, Blue Tick, very active on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and Facebook. He's very yeah, active. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I sometimes think I, should, our, I should make yeah. a booking through his Instagram app because, <laughs> you know, even at two o'clock in the yeah. morning because he responds. He responds, yeah. <laughs> and, and guys, one other thing I, I'd add as well, it's been really interesting to see this year how much PR bars in Vietnam have done. They've been incredibly active at reaching out to other Asia 50 best bars around the region. And in some cases, you know, world 50 best bars mm. from Australia, uh, from Barcelona, from Colombia, they've all been here. And if we consider that on Asia 50 best bars, it's been publicly stated that 50% of the voters are bartenders. Wow. I would like to, yes, and so many of these have flowed through Vietnam. There must have been, gosh, there must have been 30, 40, 50 guest shifts this year. Collabs, yeah. So it'll be very interesting to see if that's effective. And when in July the Asia 50 best bar results come out, you'd like to think that there'd be more than one bar from Vietnam on that list. Yeah, you'd think so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, going on those numbers. And so if there is, then we can see that there's some benefit by having a lot of this, uh, uh, these these guest shifts and a lot of those visits and, Mm -hmm. and so on. So I think um, that uh, flows really well with the next question we wanted to ask you, Chris. So, you mm. know, I think it would be fair to say that the elephant in the room on awards <clears throat> night is clarity around why some mm. restaurants or bars, for that matter, win awards and others don't. Um, how mm. seriously as diners or people who love a cocktail here and there, you know, should we take these awards How seriously, sorry, how seriously should we, you know, think about that? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And and given that it's food, it's probably going to be the most emotional category or subject anybody (laughs) could ever consider trying to have any ranking systems around, Mm. isn't it? Because absolutely everybody loves food and has a different relationship with food. But I think broadly speaking, to have a, to try and have a ranking system to try and have a guide must be generally a good thing for the consumer. Um, You know, I guess if you were researching on 50 Best and it came up that you need to go and try Anan Saigon, you'd probably go down and say, okay, that was a worthwhile experience. I do think, again, just just from doing a little bit of reading before our, our call today, it is quite transparent as well around how they kind of put these lists together and there's a criterion you know on michelin which is going to be coming soon maybe we'll talk about that but there's five key factors isn't there around uh the produce used techniques Mm -hmm. personality of the chef i think value for money and of course Mm -hmm. consistency and then 50 best is is supposed to be a bit more of a dynamic list it's a snapshot in time it's all about restaurants offering unique culinary experiences Mm -hmm and being very reflective of the current trends. And that's why that, that list kind of moves, moves around a lot. Whereas Michelin, it's, you know, as we said earlier, it's a bit more ongoing excellence and rumors are swirling around the market <laughs> that maybe, that maybe Tatler is on its way as well. So hopefully as Michelin comes in in June and maybe Tatler possibly towards the end of the year with a top 20 list, hopefully that's going to kind of support the industry and, provide more of a framework. Hmm. 
Hey, so let's stay on awards just for a little bit longer. It's been an interesting mm. year for restaurant awards in Vietnam. First, the top gong at the Viet Cetera Awards went to a burger joint in Hanoi mm. that barely anyone seems to know. And now yeah. just one entrant in Asia's 50 Best. What does this mean for the hopes of those restaurants wanting a Michelin star in Vietnam? Mm. I mean, interesting one, just just to begin with, with the, the burger joint, as it were. So that place is called Nyom, isn't it? Have I pronounced it correctly? Yeah. Yeah, N-G-O. Okay. It's one of the most A-M. And I have to say, yeah. I have to say, I've been there. Uh, Tuan, the, the owner, studied and trained in uh, Northern Europe. Really good guy. The burger was really good as well. So, I mean, I have to say that. Um, also have to probably declare they are the Viet Cetera Awards. And I did work for that that title as a contributor okay. up until December. So yes. there's a, there was a bit of a vested interest there for me, but I was not involved in those awards that, that came out this year. But, I mean, the reflection, Matt, for these awards is they're only – they're only as good as their methodology and the preparation around them, aren't That's they? Right. And so those those awards based on the jury, the jury that V et cetera chose, they would have chosen 20 voters who were all published and made publicly available. And I guess, according to V et cetera, that jury is representative of their readership, isn't it? So mm. I guess when you, when you take those 10 awards that V et cetera, you know, uh, published, that would theoretically be the, um, you know, the, the snapshot of the, the bar and dining scene according to their readership. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fair. And also, mm. like, maybe in terms of the judges that were invited, maybe they were younger, maybe they were looking yeah. for less expensive um, fare. You know, yeah. it, it could... It, it, really boils down on the preference yeah. of individual judges. I kind of like the idea yeah. that a burger joint, well, is it a joint? Can we say it's a joint or is it a restaurant? Because I haven't been to it. I, well, I guess it would have to be a restaurant. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's good though, I think, that, you know, it, it means that if you have a place that does burgers, you're a chance, you're in the running. In different awards, yeah. in different levels, different categories. But it's one restaurant of the year. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's not really, it wasn't really for me to comment on it, but where I think sure, it's, sure, sure. it's garnered a lot of interest in the industry was, you know, there was 10 awards given and three of them went to that, that burger joint, as it were. So mm. it's, um, yeah, Ooh. understandably, it seems to have um, delivered a lot of conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. got us talking, hasn't it? It, it, it flipped a few. Uh, <laughs> 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 that Flip. comment yeah. sizzling, yeah. Mel. Yeah. <laughs> well, <Quite> cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I'd like to move on to the fourth question. Yep. Um, so Chris, what trends have we been seeing in restaurants and hospitality in Vietnam in 2023? So it's April now. Um, and what can we expect for the rest of the year? Oh, this, well, this is a fresh one because, yeah, I've been out and about quite a lot recently. And I just kind of noted down a few. How would I kind of package these up? Mm. The first one. The first one, which springs immediately to mind, I've called it the rising confidence of flag carriers. <laughs> what? what? Yeah, there's a little bit of a, a pun involved in it here. Is that, um, is that good for SEO? That one. No. <laughs> if it is, let's get let's let's go with it. Yeah. Um, but look, this is all about what I've seen at Lady True Gin, what I've seen with La Cat, and of course the likes of Anan Saigon and, and Maru and so on. But I mean, what's been very impressive has been almost the, the vertical integration of Lady True. So, okay, uh, as, as Matt has shown in that really good video you did a few months ago when you went and visited the distillery oh, yeah. in the Mekong Delta it needs of a Lady few True. More views, so we by always, the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we always knew it was a great quality gin, but they've opened this fantastic uh, bar restaurant on yeah, Maxi Boy. With yeah. food as well. Is, yeah. yeah, and it's absolutely showcasing that brand in the best possible light and elevating the kind of the the association and awareness of Vietnamese gin. And um, the great story behind the, it as well. Yeah. Like mm. The lady true, you know, folklore mm. behind it is amazing as well. Historical, yeah, yeah traditional. Yeah, so I mean, uh, and so, so that's going very well. And actually yesterday, La Cat on the Wing Kong True, uh, 220 Wing Kong True, I was there 
because they've opened their their coffee shop next door to their shop, if you like. Okay. Um, yep. Roast, I've, I've the done roast an injustice the, there, but it, yeah, I know where that is yeah. on the second floor up there. Mm. Yeah, so it's yep. kind of it was always kind of like a visitors center. You could you could go and see all the right. best of their product. It was all beautifully laid out. But now you can just go next door and you can actually enjoy the coffee served at it at its its perfect at its perfect level. Really, so that was that was opened up yesterday. So you you're seeing La Caf coming through from a coffee perspective doing that. So the trend is from farm to table, essentially, but or like the what, whole product yeah. line, but the whole supply what, chain. What Chris is talking about mm-hmm. is sort of flying the flag for the country. So yeah. the the whole brand story is, is, about, a, is about the history or yeah. maybe in the coffee sense it's, yeah, it's mm-hmm. farm to, yeah. to cup. And the Lady Chu one is, um, you know, the history of yeah. Batu. And, of course, Maru is like, you know. Yeah, great story yeah, as chocolate well. Chocolate was here before, then it disappeared. Yeah. Now it came back. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, these guys have shown by investing in their brands that, that the Vietnamese brand can, you know, can be considered on exactly the same level as the international brand. And, and so I'm sure there's going to be more people being aware of this and looking to invest behind Vietnamese produce as well, but two wonderful examples there. Yeah, they were awesome. Okay, Chris, so last question before we let you go and have a hot cross bun. If I had a pretty (laughs) serious food friend coming to visit me soon, what would be the one restaurant I need to take them to? A food friend? Like, hi, did I say I'm a, a potato. Did I say, yeah, you did. Oh, did I? Michelin Man. If I were to bring Michelin Man. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Sorry. If I had a pretty serious foodie friend coming to visit me soon, what would be the one restaurant I need to take them to? So they're only in Vietnam like Can 24 be. hours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, or 48 hours. No, I've only got the budget to take them to one restaurant. <laughs> okay. But it could be anywhere in Vietnam. Yeah, so given that it, it's somebody's really foodie focused and uh, they're only here for kind of for, for one night, so yeah. I, I'm not necessarily needing to showcase Vietnamese cuisine to them. No, not necessarily. I would recommend, yeah, yeah I'd recommend uh, La Villa in Taudian because from a foodie perspective, I mean, it's all there. Uh, there's a tasting menu of mm. more than 10 courses, absolutely fantastic, but these guys have been in business for over 10 years. Oh, wow. It's, yeah. uh, it's a husband and wife team. Fantastic French chef, Thierry, uh, who's married to Trang, uh, also goes by the name of Tina, who is incredible at front of house and liaising with guests. Beautiful kind of hospitality experience. So I'd probably, I would take them there. Ooh la la. Yeah. French restaurant in District 2. Yeah. We'll check it out tonight, will we, Mel? Oh, my birthday's coming up. <laughs> So you can take me there. All right. All right. Birthday dinner. All right, Chris. Well, I know, yeah. I know the owners, like, like so many of the oh, many make, make a call, will you? No, <laughs> don't do that. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, guys, any, any respectable hospitality player here listens to this podcast. <laughs> so uh, oh, do within they? 24 hours of it going live, I'd be expecting uh, a communication. Well, we're going to zoom up the charts this week with you on it. <laughs> All right, yeah, Chris. let's hope we can get into the top 50 in Australia. Yeah. Eh? yeah. Again, again. 69 already. But, so. uh, we actually uh, went higher during the week. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so 69 is no longer your favourite number. Uh, uh, no. It's, <laughs> yeah, I don't stop at 69, put it that way. So anyway, Chris, uh, on that note, we better let you go. Thanks again for being a part of this episode. Thanks, Chris. Uh, oh, pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And, hey, I just want to let you know if there were an award for best hospitality editor in the region, I'd give it to you. Yay! Uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I'm going to spend the afternoon thinking about a sponsor for that. And, uh, <laughs> maybe we can get it going. <laughs> awesome. Thanks a lot, mate. Enjoy your Easter holiday. Thanks, guys. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a like, share and comment and feel free to ask any questions related to Vietnam and the region on the Bureau Asia's social media channels at the Bureau Asia and I'll do my best to answer them. Mal, as usual, thanks for joining me again. Any plans for the coming week? Uh, there might 
Sun birthday cake. Yes, don't forget my birthday. It's on Friday. Yeah, happy birthday. Thanks. Thanks heaps. So that's it for this episode. Don't forget to send in your comments and questions before our next episode so we can comment and answer. Which reminds me, don't miss our next episode because we have the founder of Blue Dragon Children's Foundation here in Vietnam, Michael Brzezowski. Oh, wow. Yeah, joining us. He's going to join us and he's going to tell us about all the great work Blue Dragon is doing in relation to human trafficking in Vietnam. So that should be a good one. So until then, take care and stay safe. This is Matt Cowan. And Melanie Kasul. Enjoy your week wherever you are.